Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, so for the first 45 minutes module, <coughs> we are going to uh, redo a recording of the uh, two species model and we are going to work on uh, a predator prey model. So we're going to use this model for the whole three hours. We'll start with a visual examination of uh, equilibrium. Then we'll do some actual um, differential equations, um, simulations, and by the third uh, module, we will do some experiments with equilibrium and dispersal. So we'll try to uh, push the system away from the equilibrium and get a sense visually of what it's going to, um, to do. So the uh, model we want to work on is a predator-prey model, uh, and one that is slightly different from the Lotka and Volterra uh, predator and prey model for a reason that is fairly simple, which is that the uh, standard Lotka Volterra predator prey model tends to have a more complex behavior in terms of its uh, stability. And we want something that is uh, a little bit simple, but also we want to talk about the idea of building models incrementally. So one model we know for a population that is alone is a logistic growth model. So if um, there is a population and it's initially at a low abundance, it's going to increase almost exponentially, and then it's going to reach something called the carrying capacity, uh, and it's going to stop here. So that is a good basis for the, uh, for the model of the prey. So we're going to write an equation for the prey. It's going to be dx. It's going to need two uh, population sizes, uh, y. Uh, x is a prey, y is a predator, and p is going to be the parameters. This function is going to be uh, x times uh, the parameter named r, r times one, uh, one, one point zero minus x. That's fine. That is a model. And then the spray is going to uh, experience some predation. And the predation is going to be <coughs> experienced at a rate which is p of, uh, let's say, beta time x time y. So we have our two, uh, we have our two uh, mechanisms here. We have logistic growth and then we have predation. The one thing that is sort of implicit in the model here is that there is no carrying capacity. It's not x over k, it's just x. That is sort of a shortcut we're taking because we're going to say, well, um, k is going to be one. So in the absence of a predator, a prey population that starts at a non-zero density is going to reach an equilibrium size of one. If there is a predator, there is going to be uh, some, uh, some quantity of the population that is removed through uh, the effect of predation. Um, at this point, it's, it's, it's important to note, that it's going to come in handy later, that uh, we have x times something and x times something. So we can rewrite this model uh, as being uh, the population size of the uh, prey times the difference between growth and predation. So that's something that is already telling us uh, a little bit of information about the mechanism. If the predation is more important than uh, the growth, the population will decrease. Uh, if growth is more important than predation, the population is going to uh, increase. And then if growth and predation are about the same, and the population is going to remain the same. We'll do the same thing for the, uh, for the predation side of things. So it's dy is going to be a function of x and y, the two population sizes, and also the parameters. So we know that um, predation is expressed as x time y times something. So the, the beta parameter here is what is the cost for one prey of meeting one predator. When we are uh, modeling the, uh, the predation side of things, we can reframe this question as being what is the benefit for one predator of meeting one prey? So we're going to call that P 
uh, gamma. And then because this is a predator, it's not able to sustain itself in the absence of the prey, which we can uh, express as it is going to decay exponentially if the prey is not here. Uh, and the way to write an exponential decay is uh, minus a constant times the population. Again, we can, we can see that x, it's something times y minus something times y, and so we can rewrite this model as being y minus uh, x time p gamma minus p delta. And we can do the same thing here, which is to say if um, the benefits from predations are higher than the uh, base mortality of the predator, the predator population is going to increase. But if the uh, benefits from predation are lower than mortality, then the uh, population is going to decrease. What is important is that in both cases, the cost of predation and the benefits of predation are going to depend on the population size of both components of the model. So if there is a very high uh, population density of the predator, it's going to be different from the situation where there is a low population density for the predator. So let's run that. Uh, and then what we're going to do is the same thing that we've done uh, last time, which is to say use a function that is going to return a function. But the function that we will return is going to be um, parameterized. So we are going to call that mx of p. And it's going to be a function of x and y. Uh, that is dx x, y, p. And then we have m, y of p, which is going to be a function of x and y, that is going to be dy, x, y, p. Now because I, we want to be very, very lazy with what we do, we are going to do a function uh, m of p, which is going to return m, x of p, m, y of p. So if we call m of p, the thing that is going to happen is it's going to do m, x of p, m, x of p is going to be a function of x and y, and it's going to be dx. And then it's going to do m, y of p, uh, m, y of p returns a function of x and y, which is going to be dy. So it's going to return both of the components of our system um, at once. Uh, let's take a guess at some initial values here for the parameters. So we need three parameters. Uh, we need R, we need beta, and we need uh, gamma, we need delta as well. Nope, not the other delta, this one. Okay. So let's say we are going to take R equals 1.1, beta equals 0 0.02, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. So some of these parameters do have an interpretation that is fairly um, straightforward. Um, delta in particular is a rate of decay, so it's losing 1% of the um, population size at all time. Um, some of them are not that intuitive to think about. They're expressed as units of biomass per units of contact per time, for example, whatever that means. But we'll just play around with the parameters. Um, this object we have here, P, uh, let's look at the type of P, is called a NEM tuple. So a tuple, as you'll remember, is something that cannot be modified once it's created there is no chance that the values within a tuple are going to move. So it's a way to store the parameters that is really, really safe. We want our parameters to be unchanged. We want our variables to change, but not the parameters. So we're going to be using names tuple quite a bit to, um, to pass the arguments. Okay, so let's have a look at M of P. Right, let's, let's run this code before. Uh, and then call m of p. <coughs> so m of p is, um, it's a tuple of things, right? So we're going to, um, we are going to do dx dy. 
these are going to be our functions. Okay. So one thing that we can do when a function is returning um, several things is allocate different variables at the same time. So this function m is returning uh, mx and my. So if we say dx and dy equal mp, what it's going to do is take the first element of, uh, of what is returned by m, put it in dx, and the next element, put it in dy. There are some mechanisms where we can use one variable to capture everything else or things like that, but for the moment, uh, we are just going to uh, create functions with our parameters. Uh, let's have a quick look at uh, dx of 0, 0. So dx is going to give us a change in the size of the prey population. So in a system where there is no predator and no prey, that should be uh, 0. In a system where there is one unit of prey and no predator, which is to say the prey has reached its uh, implicit carrying capacity, that should also be zero. Let's make a quick test that if we have more than the carrying capacity, it should be negative. Yep. And let's make a quick test that if we have reached a carrying capacity, but there is also some predator, it should be negative because there is some predation. Cool. So we've done this little like sense check of the results. Uh, and so the, the dx function uh, can be used. Now in the, in the uh, module just before that, we looked at visual identification of equilibrium. And what we've used was a, the number line, which was the population size, and then the derivative. And that was working because we only had one, um, we only had one population. Now we have two populations. So instead of having something that is a line, we need to have something that is a, uh, a plane, that is a matrix. So we are going to do something that, um, something that is uh, essentially the same thing, calculating the value of the derivative for x and y at different points, where the points are specified by the population size of x and y. So Let's go with that. We are going to do um, uh, something called gradient of x. Uh, it's going to be 0. It's going to be floating point values. Uh, and we are going to do, uh, we need to have the population of x, which is going to be a linear range. That is going to go from 0 to 5 and we'll evaluate 35 points along this line. And we'll do the population of y, which is going to be the linear range. It's going to be going from 0 to 5 as well, but we'll do 42 points along this line. The reason why we're doing 35 and 42 is because I can almost guarantee you that I'm going to get the um, side on the matrix that I need to plot wrong on my first attempt. And if we use different dimension, it's going to tell us that the dimension don't match and now I will know in which uh, direction I need to put my matrix for plotting. Uh, I could either do that or read the documentation and learn things, but I refuse to learn things. So let's go with our matrix. It is going to have uh, length of Px and length of p, y dimensions. Let's do this thing, this thing, this thing. It's good. So we have a 35 by 42 matrix. That is going to store the gradient of x. We are going to uh, create the same matrix to store the gradient for y. Uh, and we could do the same thing. We could do zeros of float 64 and then the length and the length. But time is short and so we will do uh, something called similar. So the similar function, I love this one. It's a way of saying, give me an object that is going to be kind of sort of like the one I'm giving you as an argument. So in this case, it is a 35 by 42 matrix that is storing 
uh, 60-bit floating point values, but it's picking them at random. So some of them are not a number, because not a number is actually a specific value of a number. For some types of number, that's very confusing. Some of them are going to be zero, some of them are going to be very small or very large values. Anyway, it's something that is not guaranteed to have the same value. So maybe if we want the same value, just because this can be a little bit uh, disquieting to see, we could use a function called copy. And copy is going to make another version of um, another version of uh, of this variable. What we should not do is uh, the gradient of y equals the gradient of x because it's going to be the same object with two names and we don't want that. We want two different names. So similar or copy are going to be the same. Um, they, they are going to create a new object that has the same dimension and the same type. The difference is that copy is going to make sure that every value is replicated in its proper place. Similar will not. If we want to write code that is really, really fast, similar is going to be better than copy. But we don't really care about, uh, about speed for this um, example. So uh, I'm just going to document, uh, comment that a little bit. Uh, so create uh, matrices to store the gradient. That's cool. OK, they're here. And the next step is calculate the gradient. So what we need to do, essentially, is take every value of x and every value of y, so every possible combination of, uh, of parameter value, sorry, of variable values, and then measure if the population is increasing or decreasing in abundance at this point. So what we need to do is for, um, let's do ix in enumerate px, and then for jy in enumerate py. So why do we do that? We do that because uh, we're interested in two information. First information is we want the population size at this point. Second information we want is the position that it occupies in the vector here. And so because the position and the vectors are uh, reflected in the matrix, Enumerate is sort of this very convenient way of saying it's going to be at position number one and the value is going to be that. Then it's going to be at position number two and the value is going to be that. So we can take that and plug it directly into uh, the matrix. Uh, that is where I am supposed to remember how to use Digot. But anyway, what we want to do is a gradient of x. What we want to do is look at the notes because it's fine to do that. We do it all the time. Oh, we don't even need to take the gradient. I don't know what I've loaded I got. We just plug the value directly. Uh, so the gradient at position i and j for x is going to be our function dx of x and y. And the gradient for y at position i and j are going to be, is going to be dx, dy, x, y. So that's not even the gradient. That's the... Um, that is the gross, net change. We're going to call that net change. So we run that, and it's pretty much instantaneous, right? So when something runs really, really fast on the first try, always a good idea to check. Well, that seems to be certainly different values, and also different values. So that's Cool. Let's make sure that we are doing something that is uh, correct by having a little plot. So we are going to do a heat map uh, and we want px, py, and uh, the change in population size of the prey. So the first time we do a heat map, I know I say that every time, but the first time we do any plot, it is going to take some time, which is... Um, something we need to live with. Uh, and that's where we'll, we'll see if I got the uh, orientation of the matrix wrong. While we're waiting for that, let's do our little uh, annotation. Uh, no, I got it right. Hmm, surprising. 
Uh, let's do uh, predator population. So um, let's do the same thing here. Why? I did not get it right. Yes, so Jerry Prime. JY Prime. Is this something better? It's probably. Okay. Uh, let me check. So we have our population size that goes from divided by 42, and we have PY that is a linear range from 0 to 5 by 42. Our matrix, as first dimension is the length of PI, second dimension is PX, second dimension is the length of PI. We take I in PX and J in PY, so that should be okay. Uh, and this is, yeah, so, all right, for the moment, let's assume that everything is, is working as it should. So it, it's kind of clear that if you look at the, the, the value here, they get very large for very large population sizes. So it's probably that we took a, um, a gradient of value that is, that is much too um, large, and so we are going to restrict it to maybe two. We don't really have a sense of what is going to be a realistic parameter value at the moment. Yeah, that's much better. Huh, that is an interesting thing. I have made a mistake somewhere. Have I? Because this is very clearly the gradient for the population of the predator and this one. Now this one is a predator and this other one is a prey. Let's let's debug this thing. I've made a mistake once again. It's it's what we do. Uh, M is going to return mx and my. My is dy. Mx is dx. Yep, that so far so good. Uh, that is the correct equation for x. That is the correct equation for y. Um, and uh, 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 you know what? I'm sort of I'm sort of stuck. That that's fine. We're going to going to do what's known as a pro gamer move. We're going to change our little approach. M Y P. Um, so that was a good idea, that didn't work. Let's try to see what's going on. I'll just rerun everything. I don't know what... I have genuinely no idea what is going on, because it doesn't make any sense. Okay. No, it's definitely that, that was definitely not the... It looks like dx is a prey, but it's on the y-axis. That might actually be, uh, that might actually be the case. Uh, so let me, let me check. Let me check what we've done last time. Because last time I've done that, it worked. But here, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, same thing, same thing. Same thing. That is, I don't like it when it does that, but it's fine. Um, so let's, let's, Let's do a thing. No, that is definitely okay. So this is a good this is a good idea to take a step back and say, okay, what do what do we expect to see? So what we expect to see is something that will require uh, a very minimal amount of uh, 
mathematics to do. But let's get back to the equation for the model for a minute. And I... Maths, maths. Okay, so our two equations here are that. What we expect to see is that the predator is going to uh, grow at some point, not grow at some other point, and then have a value that is going to be zero at some, some specific combination. So uh, let's, let's have a look at the predator first. The so predator is growing according to this thing. So it's fairly obvious that for this thing to be zero, one solution is because it's like something times something else. As long as one of these things is going to be zero, the predator is going to stop growing. So y equals zero is going to be something. And then uh, x times gamma minus delta is zero is going to be another solution. So that is interesting because this is a function of x, and this is specifically y x equal delta. And so we have a function of x, which is x equal delta over gamma. So let's do a plot with nothing on it. And this equation x equal delta over gamma, what that specifies is actually a vertical line that is crossing the, uh, the y-axis at delta over gamma. So we're going to add a vertical line at the position p uh, delta over p gamma. Uh, we're going to have it black and then dashed. Why not? Let's look at the value of uh, the value of that for a minute. It's zero point nine. Okay, let's do x axis. Uh, it's zero two, and that is a prey population. Okay. So here's what we expect. We expect that if we look at the um, population change for the predator, it is going to uh, stop changing on this line. So if we have the, uh, let me do the y-axis as well while we're here. I'll do 0, 2, and we are going to do predator population. So whenever we will reach a combination of population densities that is going to bring us on this line, the derivative for the predator population is going to be zero, which is to say the predator will stop uh, changing. So let's keep this thing here and let's redo our little, uh, our little figure here. If we do that, then we could actually add a vertical line on top of a um, sure. So black was maybe not the best idea. Wonderful. Okay. So this is clearly this is very clearly not the um, not the equation for the predator, is it? Because it's uh, it seems to be not matching what is uh, with what is expected. What if we do this one? Uh, we're going to keep pink, I like it. It's going to be zero around uh, around this uh, point, which seems to be which seems to be fine. So let's check something else. Let's check that uh, we want this value to be larger than zero. It's going to split uh, our thing into two. I might have completely it's that is interesting. No, this one, okay. Huh. Oh, I see. 
Yes, I know what tripped me up. My bad. Okay, uh, let's do a little thing, which is minus 0 0.1. And let's let's use an actual uh, an actual color scheme that is going to be diverging at zero C equal um, red yellow blue and now we could do black and we're going to do L W equal two point okay so that's Okay, that is our uh, that is a correct plot for the uh, for the predator population density. Okay, so what the way to read this plot? Now that I've understood what uh, the problem is, and it was me and my very bad perception of colors, um, that when we are in a situation where the prey population is small, but the predator population is really high the decrease in predator population is going to be very strong. Uh, when we are in a population when there is a lot of prey and a lot of predators and the growth of the predator is going to be very strong because there's a lot of them and they have a lot to hit. And so it's going to be the, the place where they grow the most. Okay, so we have solved this problem that was not a problem. That is the entire point of modeling, right? We're just creating problems that no one really add and then we solve them and say we've done a good job um, and we can do the same thing for the prey so that is a diagram for the prey let's increase the limits on that a little bit ah i love this one this one is a little bit uh more strange what we have here is okay the prey is zero when it's at low population it's not growing when it's uh not there so that makes sense and then it's growing quite a lot and then it's starting to stop growing a little bit around here and then it's decreasing so what seems to happen here there seems to be also a separation of the space between the prey is growing and the prey is not growing one way to do that is to do gr of x let's just check this thing um, is it positive or negative and so it's like not growing, growing, uh, and then decreasing. So there's a something that looks like a line here where the population is not uh, changing anymore. So let's try to do the same thing we've done for the predator, which is to say come up with uh, a diagram that would look like that, but that would show the growth for the prey. Now the thing that is uh, interesting is that we just need to do the same thing again. So let's do the prey. So the equation for the prey is that we are interested in that being equal to zero, which is to say we are interested in uh, r times one minus x minus uh, beta gamma beta y equals zero. So what we would like to do is have this as y is a function of x because we are working on the plane and the plane as uh, x is the prey and y is a predator. So if we can write uh, y equal f of x, that is going to satisfy this condition. We'll have the same line, but for the, uh, for the prey. So let's do that. We're going to do our uh, one minus x is equal to beta y and so that's pretty cool because we know that y is equal to b r over beta 1 minus x so that is uh, not a vertical line but that is something that is an expression of y as a function of x so we can take our little plot here and we could add a uh, add a function here, which is going to be x is pr divided by p beta times 1.0 minus x. 
Uh, we're going to have this one also black. And we are going to have it solid. I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's our plane. That is the limit that we set. This is where the predator stop growing. And this is the equation for the uh, prey. OK, so that's interesting. Because they don't seem to be intersecting. And the reason they're not intersecting is because we have sort of zoomed a little bit on the predator population here, right? So maybe the issue that we have is that we're just not looking at a broad enough variation in the range of the predator. So let's say we go up to 20. No, still not enough. Let's say we go up to 50. Okay. Let's say we go up to 75. And like, you might be asking 75 what? 75, who cares? Because it's arbitrary units at the moment, right? It's expressed as relative to the prey population. Uh, if, we, if we change the value of the parameters, we can bring that if we want so that this line exactly intersects at a value of, uh, of 1. If that would make everyone feel better, we could do it. But for the moment, that's not really uh, a big deal, right? So what we have here, these two lines, they're very, very important. They are what, is called, what are called uh, isoclines of the model, and they are lines along which one component of the system is going to stop moving. So let's do lab equal predator and lab equal prey. Let's do this little plot. So this is where the predator is stopping uh, its growth, and this is where the prey is stopping its growth. That's kind of interesting because these lines do intersect at some point. And the point at which they do intersect means that the predator is not moving and the prey is not moving anymore. There is no change in the system. So the point at which the two isoclines are going to intersect is necessarily going to be an equilibrium in the system. So what we see here is that our predator and prey model is uh, it has one equilibrium where the two species are going to be present. That's sort of a big deal because there is a mathematical way of showing that, but we have a visual way of doing it here. So let's redo the little uh, figure that we did, but we are going to change uh, the range of population size that we're using. So we want the prey to go from uh, one to 0 to 2, and we want the predator to go from 0 to well, so 75. Uh, let's do 50 and 50. I'm going to run this. We are going to run this. It is also very fast. This is good. Uh, so if we rerun this, here's what we get. We have the population change for the uh, for the prey, and we are going to make sure that it's wanted to be larger than zero. That's prey population, predator population. I'm going to find a less aggressive color scheme. Green is fine. Uh, that is going to be the uh, predator isocline. Isoclean, I don't know. I only write that, I never say it. Uh, and we are going to do the same for the prey. Uh, yes, I would like to have the extrema of px, if you please, and then the extrema of py. So here's what we get. There's a little bit of, it's a little bit not smooth here because we've, we are only doing 50 points. Uh, but the, the thing is, when, the, uh, when we are in an area that is defined by populations that is green, our system is growing. When we are in an area that is uh, light, the system is decreasing for the prey. This is showing the, uh, the, the diagram for the prey only. If we do the same thing, same exact thing, but instead of taking the uh, prey, we take the predator, we will see that 
the predator is growing when it is above some threshold and it is decreasing when it is below some threshold. So what's really interesting with that is we have a way of visually identifying not only uh, what the equilibrium is, but also to think about the behavior of the system in different uh, points on this on this space. Because if we get back to this, let's get, get back to this figure. What we know is that the, the plane is going to be divided in four regions. There's this region here, 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 and here, and the behavior is going to be uh, different. Everything that is below the line for the prey means that the prey is going to be um, increasing in abundance. So it's going to be pushing the system to the right. Everything that is above this line is going to be pushing the system to the left. For the predator, everything that is under here is going to be pushing the system downwards. Everything that is above it is going to be pushing the system upwards. And so we have this four combination where we can say if we're in this quadrant of the space, we're going to be uh, going downwards and left, so decreasing. If we are here, we are still going to be going downwards but right, and so in that direction. If we're here, we're going to be upwards and right, so around here, which should bring us to the point where we go upwards and left. And so there is a chance, there is a possibility that we might have a behavior of the system where we are going to the equilibrium but not necessarily straight away. We can see some sort of spiraling behavior that is going to, uh, to happen. So during the next, um, during the next module, we'll, we'll take 15 minutes of break. During the next module, we will um, get back from these figures and then write an actual uh, differential equation system and do the numerical integration of it to see what the trajectory of this system could look like over time, but also look like in this plane. So it's going to um, keep the same idea of being very visual in our exploration of the systems. And, uh, and that is going to bring us to a point where we can start thinking about uh, applying some perturbations and thinking about equilibriums. So let's take 15 minute breaks and uh, at Let's start again at 10.10, 10, at 10.15, sorry. <laughs>